Hello, everyone, and welcome to Osteoporosis Canada's uh, webinar. We're today going to be talking about what does it take to be an effective FLS. My name is Luann Schenkels, and I work with Osteoporosis Canada for Fracture Liaison Services, or FLS. And our presenter today is Dr. Diane Terrio. And she's going to talk to you on the, uh, with a focus on essential elements. So in a minute, we're going to get started. Just to let you know, it's a stormy day in Nova Scotia, which has uh, been happening a lot lately. And so if you lose Diane's voice or presentation, it might be due to a power outage. And if so, we will send you some follow-up emails and reschedule. So hopefully that won't happen. Um, but if it does, we'll, uh, we'll roll with it. Um, any questions, you can uh, save until the end, or you can um, put them in the chat box at the bottom, and I will gather them up. So thank you for joining us. I hope you learn lots. Diane's an awesome uh, presenter, so we're going to let her take over. So uh, actually, Lauren, I don't have four o'clock yet here, so maybe we can wait another couple of minutes. Okay. And also, we could uh, maybe ask everybody to make sure that to let us know if they can't hear me uh, well or if uh, they can't see my slides. Perfect. Yeah. So in the chat box, uh, if you could send, put a note, I will be watching that. So if you have any trouble, any technical trouble is seeing or hearing, then just let us know. So right now I can see that four people have joined us. And uh, so we'll give it a few more minutes. And whenever you're ready to go, Diane, then you can okay. take off. I'll, I'll wait for four o'clock because there's, like I said, on my computer, there's still two more minutes. Okay. So well, I've got four o'clock now, so I'm going to get started. Um, so welcome uh, to all of you. Uh, and I know that you're from different backgrounds and uh, different uh, regions of the country, some with FLSs and some who do not have an FLS. Uh, so I'm hoping that um, this information will uh, end up being uh, useful to all of you. Um, and like I said, if you have any uh, problems hearing me or seeing my slides, do make sure that you uh, put that in the chat box uh, to send to Luann and uh, we'll try and sort that out. So this is uh, the first of a two-part uh, series of webinars on what makes an effective FMS. And this first part is about OC's uh, essential elements. So, in terms of what the outline is, um, we've had uh, in this series of webinar, we've had uh, a previous session that I gave on uh, the traps or the things that don't work to close the care gap. Uh, we had uh, a presentation by Dr. Sonia Singh on uh, what works uh, to close the care gap, which is the fracture liaison service. We had a presentation a joint sale on some of the barriers uh, that exist that make it so hard to close this care gap. So in terms of the outline and how we look at what works for a fracture liaison service, it's really about the lessons learned uh, in the past about what doesn't work and what works. And then we'll focus on the essential elements. So, here are the current, uh, in a very simplified manner, the current guidelines from Osteoporosis Canada 
in terms of the patients who have had fragility fractures. So very simply put, we say that if a patient over the age of 50 has had a fragility fracture after the uh, age of 50, they need to have their uh, bone health assessed. So they need either a bone density and or they need to be started on treatment. Now, this is a very simple message and it's not a controversial message. This is part and parcel of every single national and international osteoporosis guidelines worldwide. It's also not a new message. This has been part and parcel of our own Osteoporosis Canada guidelines dating back to 1996. So we've been singing this tune for two full decades now. Simple message, surely this is happening, but unfortunately, not so much. So this is data from the province of Quebec looking at women over the age of 50 who had suffered a fragility fracture. In blue, you can see that 15% of the women had received osteoporosis indication. In yellow, you can see that 5% of the women had a bone density test, but were not offered treatment. And I would uh, um, submit that that was probably appropriate care because not everyone with a fragility fracture needs treatment. But you know that blue and the yellow, that's a tiny portion of that pie. The biggest portion in purple is the 80% of women who had a, a fragility fracture and who had absolutely nothing done. No assessment, no bone density, no diagnosis, no treatment, and no hope to prevent their next fracture. So this is an important uh, problem and a problem that we need to fix. So what are we trying to accomplish? Well, we're trying to close that care gap up there. And if we close the care gap, presumably, that means that for men and women who break bone, we're going to see more bone density tests done and more osteoporosis medications prescribed. And because the osteoporosis medications are effective, we should see a drop in the number of fractures, including those dreaded broken hips, and we know that broken hips are quite serious, and in fact, there's a high mortality rate from them, uh, and they're also very expensive. So if we do reduce the risk of hip fractures, we should see a drop in mortality and in healthcare costs for these patients. Now, if we're trying to measure a successful FLS, we need to measure the right thing. So here's a little bit of a red herring. It doesn't matter how many bone density tests we do, and I'm not saying that we don't need to do them, we do need them. But at the end of the day, if no one gets started on osteoporosis medication, then there is no hope of ever preventing that next fracture. <coughs> Excuse me. So it's important that when we look at whether a model is working or not, this is the key thing that we need to absolutely reach. So I'm going to, when I'm showing some uh, data here, we're going to be focusing on the osteoporosis medication, whether or not the model has improved that number. So I want to go over a few things, and this is really a recap of, of the presentation I did on the models that don't work to close the care gap. And the first track, is assuming that the clinical practice guidelines in and of themselves will fix the care gap. So this is data from Manitoba, and we're going to look at from 1996 to 2008. And we're going to look at the orange bar. The orange bar is the fragility fracture patients who received either a bone density test or drug treatment for osteoporosis. And you can see that back in 1996, only 10% of the men and women in Manitoba who broke a bone had a BMD and or treatment. And you can see that over time, that gradually improved to about 22%. Okay, but that's the top that it reached. And you can see that after that, it plateaus for several years. 
Now, did the guidelines have any impact on the air gas? Well, this is when we had the publication of obstacles of Canada guidelines. 96, 98, 2002, and a big set of recommendations in 2005. And I think you'll agree that there's no major dent made by any of the obstacles of Canada guidelines. Well, that's a little bit uh, uh, a decade ago. So what about something more recent? So we're going to look at the province of Quebec now. And we're going to look at the purple boxes. That's the proportion of men and women who had osteoporosis treatment within 12 months of their fraction. So you can see this is going from 2000 to 2013, so a little bit more recent. And I think you can appreciate that it started out with only 12% received osteoporosis treatment after their fracture in 2000, and that gradually improved slowly but surely to a plateau or top of 16% in 2005. You can see that it stayed pretty well level until about 2010. And then you can see that it sneakily enough starts to drop down, which is, by the way, a worldwide phenomenon. And so what about the guidelines? Did they have any impact in Quebec? Well, not so much, okay? This is when we had major guidelines. Uh, and you can see that there is no improvement in the care gap. And by the way, this is not because the obstacles of Canada guidelines are not correct or are not useful. It's just that it doesn't work for this care gap. And again, this is a universal phenomenon. This is the kind of thing that's been seen in the U.S., in Europe, in Asia, in Australia, in New Zealand. It doesn't matter where you go. This care gap is very hard to fix, and guidelines don't work. So the trap number two is assuming that education can fix this care gap. And we know that it doesn't matter if you try to educate family physicians, orthopedic surgeons, patients themselves. All of those things have been tried. We've been doing this for two decades. We're very good at doing education. But yet, to close this care gap, education has failed. Now, I want to lay the foundation in terms of the next care gap. I want to deconstruct this care gap for a minute. So this is that same pie chart we saw before. And I want to go over who these patients are. You see the 20% of patients here? Who are they? Well, they're patients who, when they had their fracture, their family physician, for whatever reason, uh, at least thought of doing a bone density test and or start them on treatment, and perhaps sent the patient to see an osteoporosis specialist. So to be clear, in this pie chart, my own patient as an osteoporosis specialist, they fall in this 20%. But the FLS is not there for that 20%. The FLS is for that 80% that we're already leaving behind. So here's the next trap, which is assuming that an osteoporosis clinic or an osteoporosis specialist all by themselves can fix this care gap. I've been doing, I have had an osteoporosis clinic in Dartmouth for 30 years now. I'm a good specialist. I do a good job at my clinic, but I'm not a fracture liaison service because I simply don't see the right patient. I see patients coming from that 20% of the pie chart. So at that 80%, nobody knows they have osteoporosis. There is no reason to refer them to my office. So an osteoporosis clinic Although they do good osteoporosis work, they are still not uh, a fracture liaison service, and they're not able to close the care gap by themselves. Uh, so trap number four is assuming that a model, if it's logical and makes perfect sense, 
it's automatically going to work. And that's a trap because we've all fallen into that. And in fact, I've fallen into that trap many times myself. So I'm going to show you an example of a very good, in fact, I would call this a brilliant uh, intervention to close the post fracture care gap. This was done in Manitoba, a randomized control trial of men and women over the age of 50 who had fractures. It's a large trial. You can see the large number of patients in each arm of this study. And so we know we're going to be able to delete the results. The first arm is usual care, so nothing special was done. This is their control. The second arm, when the patient had their fragility fracture, the family physician received a letter that said, Dear Dr. Smith, your patient Annie White broke her wrist last month. This is probably as a result of osteoporosis. If not already done, you should proceed to doing a bone density test and if needed, start them on treatment. I mean, doesn't it sound so darn logical that if you do that, Mrs. Smith is actually going to get the care she needs? The third arm, the family physician gets the alert letter, same as the second arm, but on top of that, the patient themselves get a letter. It reads, Mrs. Annie White, you know your broken wrist from a month ago? That might be your first warning sign of osteoporosis. Please book yourself in to see your family doctor. You may need a bone density test and you may need osteoporosis treatment. Again, such a logical thing to do had you assume that this would work. So let's look at the outcome. Well, the usual care, you already know that there's a huge care gap, so you can expect to see that that result is going to be four. And in fact, it is quite poor. So we're looking at the outcome that we all said was the right outcome to look at. So how many of the fracture patients got started on treatment? Just 11%. So to be clear, okay, 90% of the patients did not get treated. So what about the two arms where the family doctor is got an alert and the third arm, the family, the patient themselves off? Well, I want you to digest these results. This is a statistically significant improvement. So this, the 15% and the 17% is a bit better than the 11%. But I think you can all agree that the care gap in Manitoba is still alive and well. We've only made a near dent in it. So here's an example of a brilliant, logical, makes complete sense. In fact, if you didn't know better, it's a no-brainer that this should have worked, and yet it really failed to fix the care gap we were trying to fix. This is only my own uh, slide. I've been doing, I've been interested in this care gap for well over 20 years. I've been to national and international hospitals conferences, and I always zoom in on all of the research that's looked at this care gap. I've also been across the country uh, with my work that I do with Obstacles of Canada, and I've seen many pilot projects in all provinces across the, uh, Canada. And this is my own estimation. Only about 2% of what I've seen have actually done a meaningful improvement in the care gap. And that means that about 98% of what I see has failed to fix this problem. And as much as you might think that this is true and utter failure on our part, I'm going to tell you that when we've identified those things that don't work, that is very important. So in other words, we've identified the 10,000 ways that will not work to close this care gap. And I think that's the hardest pill to swallow and the most important lesson for us to learn because there's no point in us doing the same thing that everybody else has tried that fails time and time again. So this covers what doesn't work, the trap. So let's focus now on what does work. So 
We've done so many of those interventions now that we subdivide them. We subdivide them in non-targeted interventions where we're actually trying to change the patient outcome without connecting with the patients themselves. So, for example, if you hired me to educate all of the family doctors in Dartmouth uh, to train them to treat the, the fracture patients uh, according to the guidelines, then that would be an intervention where we're trying to improve the care of the patient without actually connecting directly with the patient. And then there's the targeted intervention where we're connecting directly. So if you look at the non-targeted intervention, we already saw the clinical practice guidelines. We talked about education, but all of these things have consistently failed to make the slightest of dent uh, in the care gap. So what about the targeted intervention? Well, there you need to connect directly with the fracture patient, and that's the premise. It means you need to connect with all those fracture patients in the first place. You, your model needs to capture them all, and that's usually a system that we call systematic and proactive case finding. And in fact, we've had so many of these targeted interventions that we subcategorize those interventions into what we call the three R. So if the model captures the fragility fracture patient, they may educate the patient, they may give brochures to the patient, but no alert goes out to the family physician, then we call that a zero eye model. If the model captures the patient and then sends out an alert to the family physician, that's a one eye. If the model does all these things, plus does the bone density, and then uh, connects with the family doctor, then it's the two eyes. And if the model does it all, it captures the patient, it does all the investigations that the patient needs, and uh, then gives the prescription for the medication to the patient, then connects with the family doctor. That's a free eye model. So what do we know? Well, we had a clue on this early on when a group from Toronto did a systematic review of intervention for post-fracture care. And there were some common themes that arose in all of the models that turned out to be successful. And the first theme was that it was only in the interventions that included dedicated personnel, so personnel that had been hired to actually do this osteoporosis work, if those are the interventions that actually proved to be successful. And the other common theme is that the intervention uh, within which the bone density test was done, so that would be a 2i model, or where the treatment was uh, initiated, a 3i model, those were the ones that were successful. There was a subsequent meta-analysis that was uh, published, um, and this one very conveniently subdivided the, the intervention in the 0i, 1i, 2i, 3i. It's called the, them type A, B, C, and D. Uh, but you can see that the 3i, it was a coordinator, an FLS coordinator, that does the bone density test and prescribes medication. In the type B, the coordinator uh, did the bone density, but left the start of the blood medication to the family physician. The 1i models were the alert system, and the 0i models were, uh, were um, model where they educated the patient but it didn't go in first. So I'm going to show you in this first column now the outcomes in terms of the proportion of patients who were started on treatment. So you can see that zero I, and this is fairly consistent, zero I has no improvement compared to status quo. The one I model have consistently a little tiny increase in the rate of treatment. But I think you can all agree that there's a considerable margin of difference between the 2i and 3i model compared to anything else. And there's no doubt that they are the most effective and that those are the models that Osteoporosis of Canada considers fracture vehicle service. So to put this in terms of our 3i uh, classification, if it's 2i and above, 
is going to work. If it's below that, it will not work. So if we go back to that brilliant intervention out of Manitoba, we can look at this now and know why it did not close the quick care gap. So this was a one-eye model. This was technically a one-eye model, but it had a zero-eye uh, component to it. So similar to one-eye model, it made a little tiny dent in the care gap, but it really did not make a meaningful impact. So this is Osteoporosis Canada's definition of the fracture seat liaison service. And you can see the key components of that are very much in line with what we see in the systematic review and the meta-analysis. It first requires a dedicated coordinator. And what that coordinator will be doing is the systematic and proactive uh, case finding. The coordinator will organize the appropriate investigation to determine the patient's fracture risk. And the FLS needs to somehow facilitate the initiation of appropriate treatment. So that could be that they recommend, make a strong recommendation for initiation of treatment, or the FLS could itself start the treatment on the patient. So I'm going to move on to the essential elements because that's really more of an elaboration further on that definition. And I need to be clear on what the essential elements are. This is not about setting out the criteria for the Cadillac FLS at all. In fact, it's quite the opposite. The essential elements are setting down the absolute bare minimum that a model must do in order to be set up for success. And we did work a long time to set those essential elements together. And in fact, that, that those eight essential elements went through three different committees at Osteoporosis Canada, all of which uh, containing FLS experts before we agreed on those uh, eight elements. So this is really, uh, it's a small document that took a long time uh, to get to that point. So we're going to review the essential elements. And you're going to see, and I've color-coded them here. So the first three are all focused on that first eye. And really, it tells us how important that first eye is to the FLS of success. The one in purple below that are focused on the second eye. Uh, one is focused on the third eye. There's the importance of communicating with the family physician and then the importance of the FLS monitoring itself. So let's go through them one by one. And I'm just going to give you some illustrations into why it's important. So the first one is that dedicated FLS coordinator. And I will say that that is the one and only main stumbling block. If we did not need to hire an FLS coordinator, and we did not need to find the funding to pay the salary for that coordinator, then we'd have FLSs all over the place. But of course, it's difficult to find funding to hire an extra staff person. So lots of people, including myself, have tried to close the care gap without the dedicated coordinator because we didn't have the money. So we think of all kinds of brilliant things we can do with the existing staff to see if we could not make a dent in that care gap. So I'm going to illustrate a few of the things that I've done. So I've been at this a long time, I already told you, and I'm not a researcher. And yet, in 1998, I actually did my own little tiny clinical trial. So this was a pre and post. We did an intervention where I asked existing staff, and in this case, this was me asking the radiologist to identify the patient who had shown up in the x-ray department with fragility fractures of the hip, the wrist, or the spine over the age of 50. And then we looked at the, whether or not they were treated correctly. Now, you're going to see, so this is in the pre, and you're going to see that 41% were getting treated, but this is in the heyday of estrogen. 
Okay, and so this we don't see that after 2002. So this is the rate of treatment. And in my post, if I'm really effective with my intervention, this little block here, I should see that 41% improved very substantially. So all I ask my radiologist to do is to identify the fragility fracture patient and put on the X-ray report that this is possibly the result of a severe uh, osteoporosis and that the patient should have DMV and or treatment as per the osteoporosis and the guidelines. No, no. Please note that all of these fractures were identified by the radiologist. They won't be missing a hip fracture. They won't be missing a wrist fracture. When I say captured, I really mean did they think of going that extra step to send the alert to the family doctor with that paragraph that we had on the, the possibility of severe obstacles. So this is in the two months before we started this, and now we're going to look at the two months after. So my radiologist in the two month period only identified 13 patients. In fact, when we reviewed the x-rays in that two month period, there was a total of 59 patients who presented to my small Dartmouth General Hospital uh, with fragility fractures. So they, from the get-go, my radiologists were still leaving behind 80% of the patients. So that's going to already impact what I'm going to with the radiologist there and in this case we were looking um, okay sorry I still saw a little note that said my audio had been disconnected I hope you can hear me now um, what I uh, tried to do was a similar project with the radiologist in Cape Breton uh, this is not a pre and post this was actually a randomized control trial and for the purpose of here, I'm going to just use how many patients were identified or captured by the radiologist. So I'm lumping the, the, the control arm and the intervention arm together here. So here's the thing. So we know from five years of retrospective charts we a review that in Cape Breton, they see about 15 hip fractures a month on average. And we selected our months very carefully, December, January and February. And we should definitely see at least 45 hip fractures captured or identified as fragility hip fractures by the radiologist. So how many did they capture in those three months? Six. So again, they're already leaving 80% of the patients behind. We're back to that not being able to close the kit gap. So, you know, I thought if we can't get the radiologist to do it, and they can only do a few of them, because of course the radiologists are quite busy, how about we get everybody to get involved in this? So we did a project at Dartmouth General Hospital. We involved the emergency department, the emergency physicians there, the ortho techs there, the cast technician, and the nurses in the emergency department. We went to the orthopedic clinic, asked the orthopedic surgeons to participate, and the nurses working in the orthopedic clinic, as well as the physios. We asked uh, the, as on the inpatient orthopedic ward, same thing, and we again asked the radiologist to participate. And we figured if everybody stepped in, we'll likely have the emergency department capturing these patients, as well as somebody else in there. And to make a long story short, this was the most monumental flop of my career. Uh, we had hardly any patients captured. And my um, pearls of wisdom here on this is that the more people you try to spread out this work amongst, 
the less likely it's going to happen. And that's because everyone in these departments are so darn busy. So if they're in the emergency department and they're busy and they're saying, well, you know, I know that they're going to get captured by the orthopedic surgeon or the radiologist. So I don't have time to do that today. So nobody was captured in anywhere. Well, I'm not the only one who's tried to do this without a dedicated staff person. So this is out of the Jean Talon Hospital in Montreal. And I would say that this is a very uh, well-designed trial. Uh, and they were focusing here on non-hip fragility fracture patients. So they knew for a fact that there were 190 non-hip fragility fracture patients seeing a Jean Talon either in the orthopedic uh, the part, uh, clinic or in the emergency department uh, in the time period that they were looking at. They educated the nurses working in the emergency department and in the orthopedic clinic to identify these patients and refer them to the medical day clinic. So here it is. So start out with 190 non-hip pressure patients. Less than half were identified by the staff. So more than half were missed. But out of those patients, how many actually went to the medical day clinic? Well, very few. So if you put 54 over 190, you end up with only 28% having had a BMD and or treatment. So again, this is a small dent in the care gap, but not a very meaningful one. Uh, so this is the challenge of trying to do an FLS without a dedicated FLS first. So that's why that is an essential element. So the second essential element is to do proactive case finding at the level of the system. So that really means that we need to capture all of the patients. So this is not about dianterio in our osteoporosis clinic, capturing all of the fracture patients so that get referred to me. Of course, I'm an osteoporosis specialist. I'm not going to miss the fracture clinic, I, the fracture patients I see in my own practice. This is about capturing all of them. And so we need to know where they live in the healthcare system to do that. And that's been well uh, mapped out uh, by a group in the UK. So if you look at where the fracture patients live in the system, well, on the ward, they live on the orthopedic floor. Some of them get admitted to geriatric or medical ward. So for example, a retrieval fracture or pelvic fracture, but that number is relatively small. If you look at the, or in, the, in the outpatient clinic, it's all in the orthopedic clinic. Uh, there are a few that are seen in the emergency department and never get referred to ortho or in, and never get admitted to the hospital, so that's a small number. There are the vertebral fractures that are diagnosed by the radiologist in the X-ray department. And then there are few, that's uh, this is the last few that we put that we're not seeing anywhere else. There are a few patients who are admitted to hospital for other medical issues who fall while in hospital uh, and break a bone. So if we look at this, the, the medical and geriatric ward is a small number. The patients who are seen and managed by the emergency department alone are a small number. And the number of fractures that occur while the patient hospitalized is a small number. So if we go for where the biggest bang for the buck might be, this is the biggest three groups of patients. And I'm not going to go into details about this, but doing a fracture liaison service for vertebral fracture patients is inordinate, inordinately complicated, uh, and very few SLSs are doing this presently. You can count them on the fingers about one hand worldwide right now. So that leads to ortho inpatient and the ortho outpatient. That's where the patient lives in the system. And in fact, if you look at the 46 FLSs that we have currently across Canada, 100% of them 
are located either on the inpatient orthopedic ward or they're located in the outpatient uh, ortho clinic. So that is an important essential element. The next essential element is that the FLS must have at least one of the WHO major osteoporosis uh, fractures. So the major osteoporotic, uh, so the, here's our definition, first of all, at Osteoporosis Canada of a fragility fracture, the fracture occurring spontaneously or following minor trauma, but it excludes the craniofacial, the hand, the feet, and the ankle. And the reason those are excluded is those types of fractures do not predict future fractures. So we certainly wanted to make sure that this essential element would fit with this criteria. But moreover, it's important to know that the fractures of the hip, wrist, shoulder, and spine are the four fracture types that have the highest risk of future fractures. And those are often referred to as the major osteoporotic fractures. And it was those four, four types were first uh, brought to the attention of the world by the World Health Organization. So here's the data on this, and this is from Dr. Leslie Mandela. So we're going to look at the hazard ratio. And a hazard ratio of one means that it's not, there's no increased risk whatsoever. We're going to look after the fracture. So within one year of the fracture, between one and five years after the fracture, five to 10 years after the fracture, and beyond 10 years. So you can see that after the first group here are all major osteoporotic fractures. So you can see that in the first year, the risk of another fracture is very high. It drops over time, but you see that even after 10 years, the risk of having another fracture is very high. What about the minor fractures? So if you exclude the hip, shoulder, wrist, and spine fractures, what does it look like? Well, you can see that in the first year, there's a very small increase in the risk of a new fracture. But beyond that, there isn't. Okay, if this is called the confidence interval, and if it crosses that line, it means that it's not increased. Okay, this one almost touches, but almost crosses the line. But bottom line here is, if you had an FLS that was solely targeting ankle fractures, because the risk of those patients of having another fracture is so low, you could never show that you're decreasing fractures, even over the very long term. So if you want to be successful, you need to stick with these, okay? These are the ones you need to, to include. Now, that doesn't mean you can't include other fracture types, but it does mean you need to include at least one of these. So you could have, for example, a hip-only FLS or a wrist-only FLS, but you need to at least have one of these. So essential element number four, I won't have to tell you a whole lot because I already told you the data on it. It has to be at least two I or three I if you want to be successful. And of course, we don't want to promote this kind of model uh, because it won't have a meaningful impact. We want to make sure that we have the type of model that's going to work. The fifth uh, element is recognizing that it's really not about doing the bone density test. It's really about determining the patient's fracture risk. So we know, for example, and I'm not going to go into detail with all of Osteoporosis Canada's uh, very, uh, various uh, guidelines, but if you have a fragility fracture of the hip, for example, that's considered automatically high risk. It doesn't matter how good the bone density test is, that patient, as per our guidelines, are considered high risk and need to be treated. And by the way, this is not controversial. The fragility fracture of the hip needing treatment that is consistent 
in all national and international guidelines worldwide. So what about other fracture types? For example, if the patient had broken a rib, well, that type of patient needs the bone density test. And the purpose of the bone density test is not to diagnose osteoporosis. The purpose of the bone density test is to determine the patient's fracture risk, and they will be found to be either at moderate risk or high risk, and it's the high risk patient that we generally say need to be treated. So in Canada, we have two well-validated fracture risk prediction tools, CARA and FRAC, and the FLS must use one of those two tools to determine the patient's fracture risk. So that's that essential element. The sixth one is about treatment. And remember, that's the one level that each model must have absolutely impact in terms of uh, making a, a real difference to prevent the next fracture. So it's important that the FLS either recommend treatment or prescribe treatment, but beyond that, it's important that the medications they recommend or prescribe are proven to reduce the risk of fracture. So Osteoporosis Canada's guideline has looked at the evidence, and as a general comment, we want to prevent all fracture types. The, fra the medications we usually recommend in this list would be alendronate, fusedronate, alendronic acid, denosumab, and also teriteritol. Okay, so the seventh one, we recognize that FLS need to work in partnership with the patient's family physician. And so it's important that there's good and clear communication that goes uh, to uh, the patient's uh, family doctor. And that means that a detailed management, management plan needs to be sent out. That includes the documentation of all the investigations that the FLS has done. That there should, they should clearly state Mrs. Smith is at high risk or Mrs. Smith is at moderate risk. So you state the patient's fracture risk. And the communication must clearly give a recommendation of, to treat with uh, the first line of treatment or list the one that the FLS is prescribed. Now I put in brackets, this is not part of the essential element, but I will say that many FLS also monitor the patient for, uh, to ensure that they're taking the medication in a safe and effective way. So they monitor for adherence and persistence. The eighth essential element is monitoring to make sure that the FLS is working. So this is a this is the lesson learned. This is the clear indication that we cannot assume that just because we believe our FLS is working, that it really is working. You need to monitor. And of course, we recognize that this is the important bare level step that we need to document in order to show that the FLS will be able to prevent the fractures overall. So, the essential element A states that the FLS must monitor the proportion of high-risk patients initiated on first-line osteoporosis medication. Now, this is not about just measuring it the once and resting on your laurel. This is about monitoring and monitoring again with the purpose of improving this because no FLS will reach 100% ever on this. And this is so darn important that it's gone on to deserve its brand, its own document, uh, which was just released last uh, uh, November, the key indicators to Canadian FLS. And that will actually form the subject matter for the second part of this webinar, which will be on April 22nd. So to summarize, the essential elements are all about the first eye, the second eye, the third eye, and then making sure there's a good connection with the family doctor and making sure that we're monitoring the FLS effectively. If you are someone on this uh, call that does not yet have an FLS, 
Now you know about the eight essential elements. Now you need to know how you go about it. And that's, that's the hard part. So to get an FLS started, you really need an FLS champion. There needs to be someone with expertise in FLS, and that tends to be either an osteoporosis specialist, an orthopedic surgeon, or a family physician who works in the hospital. Uh, sometimes it could be a geriatrician as well. So various experts could be doing this. Uh, but one single FLS champion by themselves will never make this happen. You need a team, usually consisting of many people uh, um, with representation for various disciplines and various departments. The group or the team as a whole needs to agree on the FLS design, but of course it needs to meet all eight of the essential elements. And then you need to get the funding for that dedicated FLS staff person. Um, this is an example of the team at Peace Arch Hospital that was responsible for making the FLS happen there. And this is the representation of various uh, departments within the hospital. This is the team in Nova Scotia who got to the FLS at my hospital at Dartmouth General Hospital. And you'll notice that there are people on this team who are from Cape Breton or were from Kento, uh, and they were fighting for bone density at Dartmouth General Hospital because the committee as a whole recognized that you need to start one place. So we started with the FLS in Dartmouth, uh, and that was in 2013. Now in 2016, we had an FLS in Kento, and in 2017, we got an FLS in Sydney and Cape Okay, so it, it, it's a long and hard haul. In terms of when we get the funding, you may have decided you're doing the complete FLS inpatient and outpatient, but then when you get your funding, you find that it will be not enough to do all of that. So that dedicated staff person, you need to set them up for success. So if the funding is insufficient, some tough decisions will have to be made. You may have to restrict the scope that the FLS will have. You can have to scale down your plans. So maybe you wanted to do the inpatient and outpatient, but because you got very little funding, you're going to have to decide to only do inpatient. And I would strongly recommend that nobody try to do it all with insufficient funding because you'll only be spreading that FLS coordinator too thin and they'll never be able to show a good impact. So it's much better to restrict the scope, for example, if only FLS, show great results there. That will help sustain the model. You can go back to the administrators and say, see, this is working great. And only once you can show that, then you can push to expand. So now we want to do this in the outpatient department. So, and if you're getting started, there are some tools. No one has to start from scratch and doing an FLS anymore. Okay, there are lots of tools and resources on the Optical Canada website. Uh, we call that our FLS Hub. And we have a team at Optical Canada consisting of myself and Luann. Uh, and if you're going to reach out to us, do it early on. It's much preferable to get us involved and so that we can be helpful to you as you're planning to uh, in it, implement your FLS as opposed to implementing it the wrong way uh, and missing out on some of the key learning for success. So that concludes um, my webinar and I'll certainly entertain uh, questions uh, from the audience. Luann, I can't hear you. Hi, it's Luann. Oh. And uh, so, yes, I'm looking. There's no questions in the chat box just yet. Uh, so you have our email. If you don't have a chance to ask the question now, please feel free to send the questions on by email. We'll hang on another few minutes in case someone's typing. 
And uh, otherwise, thank you, Diane. You did a great job of educating uh, the group. Uh, we had only lost you for about maybe 30 seconds. So if you're desperate for that little bit of words in that cliffhanger, then send us an email. We, you were just talking about the uh, Dartmouth general results when, when it clicked out for just a second. Okay. So maybe we'll give it one more minute in case somebody's typing. Do we even know if somebody's typing? I can't really see if they're typing, but I don't see any messages yet. Okay. So um, you have our email address. We're happy to answer questions at any time. Um, and uh, I think it's good. So if there's no questions, we can uh, call it a close. And I want to thank everyone for having participated. It's great. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye.